Good evening. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, VK3 EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, with the regular Friday night broadcast coming to you from the studios of VK3 CSJ in Narry Warren South. We're broadcasting on prime frequency of 3541 kHz in the 80 meter amateur radio band and also via the Melbourne television repeater VK3RTV digital channel 1 full HD and also by my YouTube stream VK3CSJ just look for the live indication when you type in VK3CSJ in the YouTube engine there's a few images tonight in these articles of course so it's uh, of some advantage to have the video side of the broadcast uh, which in case uh, YouTube is the the way to go unfortunately there's a there'll be about a 20 second delay between what you hear here and what you see there but that's just part and parcel uh, and of course there's the Melbourne television repeater which is near to real time so uh, there it is we also have an email address I'll try and get this one correct this time uh, please send uh, signal reports and whatnot to vk3ekh at gmail.com vk3ekh at gmail.com and we also have the Wayne Factor there with his first email my apologies for scaring the crap out of you um, <laughs> um, alright I uh, the band is relatively quiet tonight on 80, so the signal should be heard far and wide tonight, hopefully. Right across Australia. So that'll be fantastic. On this AFL football eve, may your footy team win tomorrow, whatever that may be. But it should be a good game. It'll be nice and steamy hot for everybody out there. Probably ideal for those that Brisbane team. But uh, anyway... <coughs> we'll just see who wins for what it's worth also it's daylight saving weekend so don't forget to put your clock forward um, at two o'clock it's got to be two o'clock Sunday morning <laughs> and uh, for things to work the next day it would be nice actually just to have that extra daylight in the evening for what it's worth too Anyway, uh, so yes, that's the email address. We're also on Discord. Uh, Discord looks relatively quiet tonight. I don't know if it's working, actually. But uh, anyway, uh, if you have Discord, uh, look for the astronomy chat window for ASV and uh, sync up, join in, whatever. It's been a lovely day, and if you didn't see the moon rise tonight, wow, what a moon. I always reckon that the moon looks bigger on the horizon. I don't care if it's an illusion or not. I'm 100% certain that moon looks bigger on the horizon. So <laughs> uh, it was a magnificent looking moonrise tonight. And it still is up there in full bloom. No sky notes from Tanya Hill for tonight. Even though we're coming up to the 1st of October. Um, I guess it's because it was a public holiday here in Victoria. That... Um, uh, that the uh, sky notes didn't get published so uh, I'll have the sky notes for October next Friday so you just hang in there for that one all right the Astronomical Society of Victoria I know what I was going to do uh, oh yeah all right we'll have to look that out I was going to show you some pictures of the um, my uh, 3.6 meter square deck uh, the builder process um, for the dome uh, I did upload it onto the desktop here but that's where I've left it so uh, yeah that might be a bit tricky right now so I won't worry about that the Astronomical Society of Victoria founded 1922 has well over 1800 members scattered about the place uh, membership of the society is open to anyone with an interest in astronomy the Society's objectives are to encourage the study and practice of astronomy and to disseminate the knowledge of the science and to provide greater facilities for study among its members. Monthly meetings are usually held on the second Wednesday of each month, except in January, where the later being held on a Saturday night. 
meeting start at 8 p.m. Excuse me, that, that's a, a noisy car on the highway just outside here. I, that's what I have to put up with, is idiots like that. Um, yes, where was I? So, monthly meetings start at 8 p.m. at the Mulia Hall, Burwood Avenue, Melbourne, near the Melbourne Observatory, which is located adjacent to the Shrine of Remembrance. I'm sure it's just the one driver that does that. I, I, I hard can't imagine that it's multiple drivers that love coming past this property and revving the crap out of their engine. I'm sure it's just the one person that does that. He's listening to me right now and I can guarantee you within five minutes it'll come back again. Admission is free and visitors are most welcome. Privileges of membership include the right to borrow books, periodicals and other publications from the Society's extensive library located at Melbourne Observatory. Receipt of the ASV's magazine Crux containing articles, news, observing notes and the like and the free provision of the astronomical yearbook. Access is available to telescopes on members nights held regularly at the Melbourne Observatory and after the monthly meetings weather permitting. These instruments include the Society's 300mm equatorial reflector and a 300mm portable reflector. There's also a 200mm refractor managed by the Royal Botanic Gardens and I recently restored photoheliograph. I try not to say recently restored because I've been saying that for several years now so it can't be recent. So uh, it's not recent but there is a photoheliograph <laughs> which are housed at the observatory and are accessible as well. The Society also has a number of telescopes, that is 200mm reflectors, available for a short period loan. It's a telephone loan scheme, a telescope loan scheme uh, that the ASV has for members that wish to borrow or loan a, uh, a good telescope, a 200mm in this case. Uh, to uh, do some visual observing on the sky and get a kind of handle on how to use a telescope, what uh, good eyepieces can be used to look at the moon and the planets. Mm. Members are also encouraged to make use of the Society's country property located near Heathcote, uh, some 90 minute drive north of Melbourne. There are a range of instruments available for members to use with the larger telescopes uh, requiring appropriate training uh, and they range from 300 to 1000 I've just noticed that I might be clipping my audio on YouTube so I might just knock that down a bit um, one, two, 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 one, two yep, sorry about that, I just saw my levels clipping into the red. It's just on the edge there, so I hope the audio level on YouTube is okay. Somebody might like to just check that for us. Um, Alright, members are encouraged to make and use telescopes. Advice and help on both matters are provided willingly to newcomers desiring to do the same. Instrument making is only one of the number of common interest activities catered for within the society. Other areas of interest that members can participate in include deep sky observing. Just going to knock that level down a fraction more. One, two, three, four. That's not too far down. Uh, astronomical. Where was I? Um, deep sky observing, astrophotography, lunar and planetary observing, auroral, meteor, comet, radio astronomy, computing, cosmology, and astrophysics. Historical studies and research in astronomy in general contact details for various section directors are provided in the, the yearbook but if you don't have the yearbook the internet's uh, the website's the next best thing uh, for further information may be attained by visiting the asv website at www.asv.org.au and uh, there are also regular notifications via email in a publication, an, an email publication called Crux Extra, which is sent every other week to let members know what's going on, keep them abreast of things. 
So please note that the ASV will conform to all government health directives. ASV events may be required to be cancelled, postponed or moved to another time. The Secretary of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001. That's the Secretary, Astronomical Society of Victoria, GPO Box 1059, Melbourne, Victoria 3001, if you wish to write a letter. So that's the ASV in a nutshell. And uh, this broadcast has been a part of that nutshell since 1988. More information about the station can be revealed if you go to qrz.com and just type in VK3EKH in QRZ and that's all you need to know about that. Oh yes, we've got some activity on our Discord channel now. A very pleasant good evening to Graham, VK3GRK who's our resident astronomer up there at Bendigo representing the Bendigo District Astronomical Society which is a section of the ASV. G'day Graham. G'day Kim, VK5, FUSE, he's listening there, <laughs> with intent. Uh, Martin, VK7JAH, down there in Launceston. And we also have David, our resident uh, astronomer for the MBO, Mount Burnett Observatory, <laughs> Mr. KDM. Uh, and, uh, and that's it, yep, all right. And of course the VCL factor up there. Now, now if you get you must send more email. Everybody, please send an email. Okay. <laughs> VK3EKH at gmail.com. Alright, now first article for tonight. It's official. It is official. <laughs> uh, the M87 black hole is spinning. It's a great article to kick off with, isn't it? M87, Messier Object 87, the black hole is in fact spinning. Well, all right. This is dated 29th of September. We have an artist's impression of this black hole, which I'll throw up because I can. Gets me off the screen. Um... To capture the first image of a black hole, researchers had to build a telescope as big as Earth by stitching together data from observatories around the globe. When the fuzzy glowing image was finally released in 2019, every major newspaper ran it. Now that same supermassive monster which sits at the center of a galaxy called Messier 87 has surrendered more of its secrets and an analysis of 22 years worth of observations taken of M87's core has confirmed its black hole spins after the success of black hole imaging in this galaxy with the event horizon telescope whether this black hole is spinning or not has been a central concern among scientists, says astrophysicist and co-author Kazuhiro Hada from the National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. Now, anticipation has turned into certainty. This monster black hole is indeed spinning. And there's another image here, and this is a, oops, wrong one. This is a uh, an actual image of, of uh, the uh, event horizon of the black hole. So, first image is what you're seeing there is the first image of a black hole taken in 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope. Using a global network of more than 20 telescopes, researchers analysed 170 observations taken of M87 between 2000 and 2022. They could not observe anything inside the event horizon as gravitational pull of black holes is so strong that even more, sorry, even, they even make a prisoner of light, is what they're trying to say. But they could track the black hole's magnificent jet, which spans 4,900 light years across and appears to travel almost five times faster than the speed of light. 
due to an optical illusion known as superluminal motion. There you go, that's a new one on me. Superluminal motion. This jet, oh hang on, I've got a, an image of this jet. Uh, let me just bring that up. Okay, this is what we're talk about to talk about. This jet was first observed in 1918 by the astronomer Herbert Curtis, but was famously captured by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is what you're seeing on the screens right now. Scientists are not entirely sure how these powerful jets are created, but it's thought that radiation and particles are funneled along the black hole's magnetic field lines. Uh, and uh, there's another Im an artist's image here. And this one is an illustration showing the magnetic field lines of the black hole. The researchers found the black hole at the center of M87 was slowly changing the angle of its jet by around 10 degrees and then wobbling back to its original position. This cycle took about 11 years to complete. From this variation in the tilt of the jet, the researchers could infer the presence of a spinning black hole. Rotating black holes twist the space-time around them in a process called frame dragging which causes the accretion disk and the jet to topple sideways. Since, this, since the misaligned, misalignment between the black hole and the disk is relatively small and the precession period is around 11 years and thorough uh, 11 areas, accumulating high resolution data tracing M87 structure over two decades and thorough analysis are essential to obtain this achievement, says astrophysicist and co-author Sao Zuhu. M87 is of particular interest as it is only 54 million light years away, which is much closer than other galaxies. It has also fascinated stargazers for centuries. M87 was first observed in 1781 by astronomers Charles, astronomer Charles Messier, uh, when he turned his telescope to a galaxy in the constellation Virgo. Messier 87 or M87 now bears his name. And there's just one more image here, part and parcel of this black hole spinning. The, in, in this image what you're seeing is the black hole at the center of M87 has jets that wobble around 10 degrees over time. And you can see in that image that those four images show you the jet, how it actually does uh, vary over this period of time. Most black holes are thought to spin at almost the speed of light, and some black holes have already been shown to do this. A black hole that sits at the center of NGC 1365 galaxy, uh, around 60 million light years away, has shown to rotate at 84% of the speed of light in 2013. Using X-rays pulse patterns, scientists inferred that another black hole was spinning at 50% of the speed of light in 2019. So why do black holes spin so fast, you might ask? When matter collapses into a singularity or a black hole, it becomes extremely dense with very little volume, but it retains its angular momentum. If the matter if the matter came from a spinning star, its rotational speed would increase upon compression, much like how the traditional scenario here will picture, much like an ice skater spins faster when they pull their arms in. So there it goes. That's that's one for the books. Uh, you're tuned to VK3, EKH, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night cast missions, coming to you from the studios of EK3 CSJ in Ari Warren South. Very pleasant good evening to you all. I trust you're all looking forward to the footy match tomorrow, at least I know some of you are. 
Oh. Okay. G'day, Bill. The K3KHT has joined the Discord. I think Bill's up there on TV as well. Uh, we also have uh, Stephen, um, Mr. SPX, I guess, I think it is. He says, great signal, low noise, 50 at 30 over 9, Discord not working for me. Hmm. Oh, okay. Oh, it looks like it's working. I'm, 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 I'm seeing folks on Discord, so it is doing something. <laughs> I blame it on the internet. Okay. 20 past the hour. Astronaut Frank Rubio returns to Earth after breaking US space flight record. See, told you he'd be back. Useless person. <laughs> I'm sure he's listening. Um, NASA's Rubo and two cosmonauts were st stuck on the International Space Station after their return spacecraft sprung a leak. You might recall that happening about a year or so ago. After an, an accidental year-long stay in space, NASA astronaut Frank Rubio and Roscoe Cosmonauts, uh, that is Roscoe Cosmos Cosmonauts, Sergi Progov and Dmitry Petlin, successfully landed this morning on September 27, 2023, near a town in Kahasistan. That's that place, you know. The crew initially launched into space on September 21, 2022, after medical exams, the crew will be flown to their hometowns. Cosmonauts Pro Kovpev and Petlin will be flown to Star City, Russia, while Rubio will be or will board a NASA jet to Houston. The three crew members spent 371 days in low Earth orbit aboard the International Space Station, giving Rubio the record for the longest spaceflight by a US astronaut. The previous mark had been set by NASA's Mark Van Hye at 355 continuous days in orbit. The world record for the longest stint in space is held by cosmonaut Valery Polokov, who logged 4,300, that is to say, 437 decimal seven I just saw four figures straight away <laughs> then I saw the decimal dot um, anyway uh, Valerie who logged 437.7 consecutive days on the Russian space station Mir during 1994 and 1995 Frank's record-breaking time in space is not just a milestone it's a major contribution to our understanding of long duration space missions, said NASA's Administrator Bill Nelson in a press release. Our astronauts make extraordinary sacrifices away from their homes and loved ones to further discovery. NASA is immensely grateful to Frank's dedicated service to our nation and its invaluable scientific contributions he made on the International Space Station. He embodies the true pioneer spirit that will pave the way for future exploration to the moon, Mars and beyond. There is a little bit more to this article. An extended mission. The and there's another picture here. What picture I oh yeah, I forgot to bring put up that picture. Where was I? Um, there's a couple of big pictures here. Yeah. I've got a picture of this astronaut. Let me put him up. I thought I'd put him up. Obviously I didn't. There he is. That's Rubio. Um, where's the article? Okay. So that's Rubio uh, on the picture right now. Uh, the milestone comes after Rubio and his fellow crewmates were left stranded on the International Space Station along with uh, Prokov and Petlin after the Russian Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft docked to the station experienced a coolant leak on December 14, 2022. Russian Mission Control noticed the leak during preparations for a planned spacewalk by the, the, the cosmonauts. According to a NASA blog post, the walk was cancelled following the discovery to evaluate the impact on the docked spacecraft. Ros Roscoe Cosmos, 
Roscosmos engineers found that the leak was caused by an impact from a micrometeoroid. They also determined that lacking coolant, the Soyuz MS-22 was unsafe for a normal crew return, though it could be used if there were an emergency on the space station. On February 23, 2023, the Soyuz MS-23 launched an uncrewed as a rescue spacecraft to replace the MS-22, but to keep the International Space Station fully crewed, MS-23 was not scheduled to bring the crew back to Earth until the next Soyuz MS-24 was prepared. As a result, Rubio's six-month adventure aboard the International Space Station was extended to one year. MS-24 extended September 15, sorry, start that again. MS-24 launched September 15, bringing a trio of fresh astronauts, finally relieving Rubio, uh, Prokhorov and Petalin, and clearing the way for them to depart for the Earth aboard MS-23. Thursday marks a unique milestone for the American human spaceflight, and so I would like to take a moment and to uh, and acknowledge and thank all people who have helped me, this is the author, to achieve this goal, Rubio said, or Rubio said, in a NASA live streamed news briefing. So first and foremost, my wife and four kids whose resilience and strength have carried me through this entire mission, Rubio said. Rubio's extended mission and the first time in space saw him complete 5,000 936 orbits, NASA said, covering a distance of more than 157 million miles or 253 million kilometers, equivalent to about two, uh, equivalent to about 328 trips to the moon and back. The agency also noted that unusual length of Robio's stay uh, allowed researchers to observe the effects of long duration flights, a key issue as NASA prepares for Artemis missions to the moon and uh, potential missions to Mars. When Rubio was asked about what he is looking toward, looking forward to on Earth, he listed silence and relief from the noisy hum of the International Space Station and relaxing in his backyard and eating a big, big green, fresh salad. What's next? As the trio prepared to return to Earth on September 26, uh, Pro Prokov formally handed over his command of the space station to the European Space Agency astronaut Andreas Mogesen. Uh, the departure of Rubio, Prokov and Petlin marks the beginning of Expedition 70 aboard the International Space Station. And 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 uh, and there's a whole bunch of names I can't pronounce, so you'll just have to take my word for it. So there it is. You can read that courtesy of astronomy.com the article is astronaut Frank Rubio returns to Earth after breaking US spaceflight record righto you're tuned to ASV radio VK3 EKH the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria and let me put my camera back on uh, righto A little bit more on the theme of black holes, but this is a short article, and there's a sketch here too, or a, a graphic, so I'll bring that up. Okay, there it is. Do black holes have bottoms? Black holes are surrounded by a spherical event horizon and your spaceship can indeed fly under, over or around it. <laughs> is there a bottom of a black hole? Can a spaceship travel under one or does it go on and on? That's the question. I suspect your question arises from seeing diagrams like the one at the upper right, or the one on the screen right now, which attempts to show how general relativity results in the curvature of space-time around massive objects. At the top left, it is easy to see how any massive object, i.e. a star, distorts the fabric of space-time, represented by the grid in the image, but clearly has a bottom and doesn't break through the grid. 
At the lower right, the black hole looks like a funnel with no bottom, as mathematically, black holes are points with mass but no volume. This means they have infinite density, and so space-time there has infinite curvature. There has infinite curvature, yes, right. But there's a key problem with this picture. The best explanation uh, I have found, the author, comes from one of my favourite textbooks, Exploring Black Hole's Introduction to General Relativity by Edwin F. Taylor and John Archibald Wheeler. Uh, in it, the author explains that such figures, called embedding diagrams, are meant to represent the complex geometry of curved space within the limited three-dimensional Elucidin perspective printed on the page. But that flat Elucidian geometry is not curved space geometry, they write. Therefore, we expect embedding diagrams to misrepresent curved space in some ways. And that, that's, in other words, they lie. So how do they lie? With regard to your question, to the question, the vertical aspect of the diagrams is not a real dimension of space-time. The concept of death depth has been artificially added to the diagram to help the reader visualize how gravity affects space-time. Space-time is not a flat two-dimensional grid. We just need to draw it that way on the page. So a black hole is not really a funnel-shaped object sitting out in space and sucking down matter in only one direction. In addition to being an artificial representation, the embedding diagram also attempts to show what is happening inside the black hole's event horizon, the point of no return. Real black holes are surrounded by a spherical event horizon, inside of which gravity becomes the dominating force and weird things begin to happen, causing our laws of physics to break down. But outside the event horizon, the universe acts pretty normally. So you can picture a black hole from afar as a sphere, for example, as seen in the movie Interstellar. And your spaceship can indeed fly under, over or around a black hole uh, any which way it chooses, as long as it doesn't come too close. Righto. Black holes still continue to entertain us. Next article, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo, Kilo Hotel. Uh, okay, just reading your comment there. Um, you have picked up the delay audio, have I? Better not have. Um, where would that be coming in? Uh, a delay. You picked up the delay on DNT audio. Oh, I hope not. Um, I'm not sure where that would be happening. And uh, yeah, all right, I can't monitor that right now. I hope that's not too bad. Hmm. Okay. Uh, okay, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH. Time is 26, coming up to 26 minutes. To 11. NASA's Perseverance rover sets record for longest Mars drive on autopilot. Published four days ago. And we have an image of that one. Okay. The rover's autopilot even guided it through boulders not seen by orbiting spacecraft. NASA's Perseverance rover, along with its automatic navigation system, just set a record on Mars by manoeuvring right through a particularly hazardous patch of Martian land. In turn, this impressive trip saved scientists weeks of precious time during which they can now do more science. Although the mission team usually charts out the Mars rover's course manually, the automatic navigation system named Autonav proved Remarkable, in this case, 
as it safely guided the Perseverance rover around rocks hidden from orbital images typically used for planning scientists say. It was much denser than anything Perseverance has encountered before, just absolutely littered with these big rocks. Del Sesto, the deputy rover planner lead for Perseverance at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, said in a statement published on Thursday. We didn't want to go around it because it would have taken us weeks, he said. More time driving means less time for science, so we just drove right in. In late June, Perseverance entered a boulder field named Snowdrift Peak from the east. It, it first paused to inspect two rocks, then guided by the autonav, trudged right through the field. By the time the rover exited Snowdrift Peak in the late July, it had logged five, 759 metres, or 0.8 kilometres, according to the statement. The rover's covered distance is slightly longer than the 520 metres it, it uh, would have covered if it were to travel in a straight line, which scientists attribute to Autonav's help in guidance guiding perseverance around rocks not visible to the mission team and there is a video that sort of illustrates how that works so I'll just bring that up and that should start there I'll put that on a loop for a moment but that the um, the short video is illustrating how perseverance rover is scanning the surface just ahead of itself so that it does in fact it can auto nav around rocks and doesn't injure itself. So NASA's robotic explorers have remained protected on unfamiliar terrains by automatic navigators since 1997 when Sojourner, the space agency's first Mars rover, dodged dangerous rocks using silicon based navigator. But it had such a small memory that the rover needed to top stop every 5.1 inches or 13 centimeters to reorient its surroundings. With better software, those distances increased with every successor that visited Mars. Now, Perseverance doesn't need to stop to decide where to go next at all thanks to the powerful cameras and a dedicated computer for imaging processing which is together help or help autonav plan the auto the route in real time our rover is the perfect example of the old adage two brains are better than one the mission's chief engineer for robotic operations at JPL Vandy Verma said in the statement Perseverance is the first rover that has two computer brains working together, allowing it to make decisions on the fly. Those programmed brains have also helped Perseverance set previous records on Mars for off-roading 699.9 metres in the Jezero crater, the longest drive without human review, scientists say. Early this month, Perseverance kick-started its fourth science campaign by exploring the inner regions of Jezero Crater's western rim, which seems to be rich in carbonates, a tantalising clue that could shed more light on any ancient microbial life that might have existed on Mars. This area is also rich in broken rocks, high slopes and Martian dunes, according to the data gathered from orbiting spacecraft. This new terrain is definitely going to, to going to throw a few curveballs for us. And Autonav, uh, Deputy Chief of Robotic Operations Mark Mayamone, on perseverance. But what is? But that is where the science is. He says, and he says we're ready. Okay, it's tricky when they uh, they write a, an article and throw in live or live statements from the uh, other people. You've got to sort of phrase things in a way that makes it sound like somebody else is talking. It's tricky. Okay. <coughs> Enough of that. Um, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria with the regular Friday night broadcast. And now another article 
on a dusty quasar. Uh, and uh, astronomers discover thousands of active red galaxy hearts with powerful radio signals. This was published about 20 hours ago. A fraction of red quasars have been shown to be young active galaxies smothered in cosmic dust, it seems. And there's an illustration there. I might as well bring that up too while I have it. And I can click on that. Hang on. There it goes. Uh, okay. Red quasars filled with cosmic dust produce stronger radio emissions than their bluer, dust free counterparts. And these phenomena, the scientists say, could represent a generation of younger active galaxies with supermassive black holes that only recently switched into overdrive. There are still many unanswered questions surrounding red quasars, such as whether black hole wings or radio jets are ultimately responsible for this enhanced radio emission. Victoria Fawcett, lead author of the new study on this finding and astronomer at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom, said in a statement, here's another statement, However, Fawcett believes uh, we are getting close to the brink of fully understanding the nature of these incredible marvels. A quasar is the powerful central region of an active galaxy and it is driven by a supermassive black hole that is being fed huge amounts of matter. That matter forms a disk of gas around the black hole known as an accretion disk that reaches millions of degrees and releases fierce radiation winds. Meanwhile, magnetically culminated jets launch outwards from the jet, from the disk. Quasars are so bright that they vastly outshine the collective starlight of their host galaxies and can therefore be seen across the universe. Most quasars appear blue, a hue caused by optical ultraviolet emissions from hot accretion disk. However, a fraction appears red instead. To reach the, the conclusions about those red quasars, Fawcett and fellow researchers sampled approximately 35,000 quasars observed by the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument on the Mayall Telescope at Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona. On this collection, Fawcett group, Fawcett's group found 3,038 to be red quasars cross-referencing with radio astronomy data from the LOFAR, L Low Frequency Array 2 Meter Sky Survey, they confirmed that most of these red ones are also emitting strongly in radio waves. The redness comes from the presence of dust which absorbs shorter, bluer wavelengths but allows longer, redder wavelengths to pass. The red quasars must therefore be smothered in cosmic dust formed by tiny grains just microns in size. It was really exciting to see the amazing quality of the, this data and to discover thousands of these previously rare red quasars, Fawcett said. I think this is the strongest evidence so far that red quasars are a key element in, low, in, in, in how galaxies evolve. The red quasars seem to be radiating more strongly in radio waves than the blue quasars because of the interactions between outflows of radiation pouring from a quasar and the surrounding curtains of dust. As the outflows slam into the dust, they excite molecules within the dust to promote the emission, or sorry, to prompt the emission of radio waves. Over time, the outflows driven by the energy of a supermassive black hole hungrily feeding on vast amounts of matter will blow the dusty cloak away to leave a naked blue quasar within much, with much weaker radio emission force it calls this the blow out phase. Therefore, when astronomers see a red quasar, they are seeing a younger quasar than if they were seeing a blue one. <laughs> the realisation that red quasars represent a young, younger type of quasar could prove to be an important missing piece in our understanding of how galaxies develop and evolve over time. It's believed that most galaxies at one time or another 
undergo a quasar phase and that there is an observed relationship between the mass of the supermassive black hole and the heart of a quasar and the mass of the galactic bulge belonging to the quasar's most gala host galaxy. In other words, quasar activity seems to help glow, grow, that is, the mass of the galaxy. I'm just going to leave that there. There's one paragraph left, but I think you get the gist. So, you're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel, the official station of the Astronomical Society of Victoria, quarter to 11. And a little bit of a promo for astrophys.com. G'day to Brendan O'Brien if you are listening, dear sir. His latest Astrophys episode is... Um, is episode 179 and he interviews Dr. Daniel Palumbo uh, about the Event Horizon Telescope. He says here, oh come on, oh hang on, I haven't changed my vMix yet. Um, I'm forgetting about vMix, there it is, okay. Um, today we are speaking with Dr. Daniel Palumbo from the Harvard Smithsonian Center of Astrophysics. Daniel is an astrophysicist and data scientist with the Event Horizon Telescope who worked on those amazing black hole images using data from Planet Sized Telescope, the EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope. He is involved in ongoing work uh, on the Next Gen Generation Consortium. In this episode of Astrophys, he shares his science journey how the EH2 works and how he worked with imaging teams to produce those two historic and stunning black hole images from the, our Milky Way Galactic Center, Sagittarius A, and the more distant supermassive black hole M Messier 87 mentioned before. So yes, have a listen to uh, Astrophys 179 and uh, listen to that interview with Dr. Daniel Palumo. Okay, uh, no, I don't want my email. Uh, next on the list, next on the list. If I can just find my camera, there we are. Okay. <coughs> what would happen to Earth if a large asteroid hit the moon. It can take millions of years for debris from a lunar impact to fall to Earth and most modern day strikes are small. Asteroids plummeting the, or plum, plumbing, plumbing the lunar surface is an ongoing process. Geologists listened to the thumping of impacts with seismometers placed on the moon during the Apollo missions and astronomers continue to record collisional impact flashes with Earth-based telescopes. And there's uh, just a, an image here of the moon with a, a circle around it. Most impacts are small but as recently as 2013 an intense flash of light led geologists to a freshly excavated 62 foot diameter 19 meters crater at Mare Librium. When larger asteroids produce craters with diameters of a few hundred meters, rock is catapulted into space, catapulted into space at escape velocity. Some of that debris collides with Earth, usually within a million years blazing trails of ionized gas through the atmosphere before falling to the ground relatively harmlessly, like other meteorites. Researchers have recovered several hundred of these lunar meteorites and placed, traced them to over a hundred different asteroid impacts that threw out rock from the moon in recent past. Deeper in geologic time, an intense epoch of asteroid bombardment produced impact basins on the moon with diameters larger than 185 miles or 300 kilometers. During that 4 billion year epoch, the moon was about three times closer to Earth and three times larger in the sky. Each struck Earth with 100,000 years of impact. Alright, let me read that in. 
Where was I? Each, each struck Earth with 100,000 years of impact. It's funny how that's worded. Uh, let me just try that again. Each struck Earth with within 100... Oh, here we go. I forgot. The with, it's a, it was within. I'm, I'm reading with, but it's actually within. Oh, jeez. Okay. So, I knew it sounded strange. Uh, each struck Earth within 100,000 years of impact, filling the sky with countless meteors. The largest of these fragments survived atmospheric deceleration and created Earth's surface, potentially per per perturbing uh, microbial, microbial communities. Microbial. <laughs> but these impact events were dwarfed in number, and the size of the asteroids that took aim at Earth directly, asteroid bombardment and how it shaped the Earth-Moon system is a key scientific target for Artemis exploration. Astronauts will soon be walking across an impact cratered landscape collecting clues about those collisional processes. So stay tuned for new revelations in respect to that. Okay, um, vmix again. And uh, this one here is just a little bit of a, uh, a plug from Mount Burnett Observatory. So I shall just bring up the website for that. So if you live in the hills, uh, the Mount Burnett Observatory is about a 20 minute drive from right where I am here. On your way to uh, Emerald Gembrook area location. And uh, to find out more information about uh, the Mount Burnett Observatory, just to cu um, just uh, um, enter uh, Mount Burnett Observatory in the search engine, and you'll very quickly find the home page, which is on the screen as we speak. Mount Burnett Observatory is a non-for-profit astronomical society based at Mount Burnett in the Dandenong Ranges, east of Melbourne. MBO is the focus of a thriving community of astronomers for all ages drawn together by a common love of learning about the night sky and the objects in it. The observatory used to belong to Monash University back in the 60s and 70s and uh, became disused there for quite some time but uh, now it is a hive of activity most Friday nights. So like I say more information about uh, Mount the MBO, Mount of Burnett Observatory, just go to the websites. You're tuned to ASV Radio, VK3 EKH. <coughs> In recent weeks, I've been talking about, um, or have mentioned about the Indian lander on the moon. Uh, in recent, uh, a few months ago, um, well, about a month or so ago, the uh, Indians launched a, uh, a probe to uh, to the South Pole part of the region of the moon. Well, it looks like it's dead. It's looking increasingly like India's historic lunar lander is dead for good. India made history last month as the first country to land near the moon's South Pole. Actually, I've got a picture here of that. There it is, the actual lander on the South Pole. Um, yes, but several days after they were set to wake up, the Chandurian 3 moon lander and its sidekick lunar rover remains fast asleep. And now it seems like they may be dead for good. The robots went to sleep in early September when night set in on the moon's on on, on that part of the moon and of course the batteries drained. The next lunar day started on September 22 and the Indian Space Research Organisa Organization hoped the two spacecraft which run on solar power would awaken uh, that day as the sun rose on the moon and the solar panels recharged. Unfortunately the VIK RAM lander and the Pragyan rover didn't respond to missions control messages. Additional attempts to wake them up on Monday were unsuccessful and scientists told the BBC that the chances of the historic lander reawakening are dimming with each passing hour. 
it was always likely that the two robots would with would with sends uh, it is it was always unlikely that the two robots would withstand the moon's elements. The technology on both the lander and rover weren't designed to withstand nighttime temperatures on the moon. The New York Times reported which can reach as low as minus 334 degrees Fahrenheit according to NASA. So that little Indian probe on the South Pole is not, not working, which is a bit sad. So the path lies way now for NASA to send their probes. I know they're, they're planning to get there too. Okay, coming up to the end. Uh, okay, now, some for those who listened to the WA broadcast last Sunday, might have noted the, um, the little article or review on a radio astronomy book being published by the CSIRO or uh, those folks anyway um, anyway I thought I'd run a, a bit on, on this as well and I've got a picture of the book here um, there it is bring it up okay so it's titled Joe Pawsey and the Founding of Australian Radio Astronomy Early Discoveries from the Sun to the Cosmos. Uh, this open access book is a biography of Joseph L. Pawsey. It examines not only his life but the birth and growth of the field of radio astronomy and the state of science itself in the 20th century Australia. The book explains how an isolated continent with limited resource grew to be one of the leaders in the study of radio astronomy and the design of instruments to do so. Pawsey made a name for himself in the international astronomy community within a decade after World War II and coined the term radio astronomy. His most valuable talent was the ability to recruit and support bright young scientists who became, who became the technical and mythological innovators of the era, building new telescopes from the Mills Cross and Chris, Trish, uh, Chris Christensen Cross to the Parkes Radio Telescope. The development of the aperture synthesis and controversy surrounding the cosmology cosmological interpretation of the most major survey which resulted in the, in the Sydney Research Group disagreements with Nobel Laureate Martin Ryle play a major role in this story. This book also shows the connections among prominent astronomers like Ort and Muronsky, Braid, Servant and f famous scientists in the UK such as J.A. Radcliffe and uh, Edward Appleton and Henry Zidard and engineers and physicists in Australia who helped develop the field of radio astronomy. Pawsey was appointed the second director of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, Green Bank, West Virginia in October 1961. He died in Sydney at the age of 54 in late November 1962. So, yes, so the book is uh, dedicated to the early uh, developments of radio astronomy here in Australia and it is um, 865 pages, uh, quite a read, and uh, it's available in hardback or uh, soft cover. and uh, just go to Amazon.com if you want to look at that. So there it is. Um, <laughs> oh, bring back the camera. All right. Um, back to me, back to me. Spaceweather.com. Unfortunately, there's no uh, no video from Timotha Scoves. Uh, no latest or current solar reports from Timotha. So we have to wait until uh, hopefully next week for a, uh, a report from Timotha. So, okay, with spaceweather.com, uh, solar wind is currently at 438.5 kilometers an hour, 
it is blowing a gale at a density of 400 and sorry <laughs> I'm just tired I am super tired I can feel it um, so start again the solar wind is 438.5 kilometers a second at a density of 4.43 protons per cubic centimeter the current disk of the Sun looks like this and we have several sunspots um, visible on the disk as we speak the current sunspot number is 109 the radio sun at measured at a wavelength of 10.7 centimeters is currently 148 solar flux units the KP index, the planetary K index, the KP is currently 3.67, which is considered quiet. The 24-hour max KP figure is also 3.67 and also considered quiet. The uh, if we look at Antarctica, the current auroral oval. Uh, over Antarctica looks a bit like this although uh, oops that's me um, <laughs> oh dear sorry <laughs> no there it is on the visions right now actually it's faded from view a little bit that intense green glow that you're seeing there is, is a little bit less because when I looked at spaceweather.com just a moment ago um, it's actually uh, just a little bit less than what you're seeing on the screen because I, I captured that at the beginning of the hour so it's a little bit less than that at the moment but nevertheless that's roughly what it looks like um, okay and having said that uh, I think that's about all I need to say out of spaceweather.com the oh, where are we no, they're not showing it. All right. Um, they also say uh, that even though it is a quiet weekend, uh, they say here last weekend a CME hit Earth's magnetic field, sparking two days of geomagnetic storms and an outburst of rare red auroras. This weekend will be completely different. No CMEs are heading for Earth, and our planet's magnetic field should remain calm and quiet as indicated in the KP figure so uh, it should be a good a quiet weekend on the HF bands I would say uh, and uh, as of the 29th of September 2023 there were 2,349 potentially hazardous asteroids all of them mostly listed on, QRs, um, on spaceweather.com <laughs> all right that's about it uh, I don't think I've got anything else there to carry on about so I hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, session I hope there was at least some value in it uh, we did have a black hole theme um, tonight which I haven't done for a while sort of tried to avoid it a lot of articles do come through uh, about uh, black holes and um, it's, it gets a bit tricky to uh, read out uh, a lot of stuff on that uh, so uh, there it was I think I, uh, I got that all passed this time so next week we can talk about something completely different uh, we should have Tanya's uh, Tanya Hill's uh, science uh, sky notes for uh, October and uh, for next week that usually takes about 25 minutes to get through if Tamifa has released a solar report we'll have her report and uh, anything that's new in the scheme of things so with that I shall say a very pleasant good evening to you all <laughs> although I will take a quick call back on 80 meters um, so uh, like I say I hope you've uh, found uh, some of the articles tonight of interest um, uh, next Friday I think we have the Eastern Mountain District Radio Club uh, back on RTV um, Peter Cousins VK3BFG has been working exceedingly hard at trying to get the ATV transmitter uh, working at the EM EMDRC's uh, um, uh, club hall rooms and uh, he reports that uh, 
uh, in the first week, I think it is, of October, uh, when EMDRC has their first monthly meeting, something along those lines, uh, there will be a live transmission on RTV2 uh, a few hours before me. So I'm on RTV1 and uh, EMDRC will be on RTV2 so there won't be any clash if, uh, if EMDRC continues to go on beyond 10 o'clock. But I'm just saying that uh, welcome back to EMDRC VK3 Echo Radio on RTV. It's really great to see you guys uh, um, back on TV. Uh, at least as of next week. So, excellent stuff. Um, Alright, okay. Uh, let's have a quick listen on 3541 kilohertz and see who might be wanting to check in. This is VK3 EKH, listening on 3541. VK3 BDO Bendigo. VK3 Bendigo. VK5 Kilo Kilo Tango at two worlds. VK3 all right, there were a few doubles there, but I think I've got everybody. VK3 BDA, VK3 TJS, VK5 KKT, VK3 JR, VK7 JAH. Was there anybody else? Uh, VK3 Alright, VK3 SBX, VK6 YSF, anybody else? Oh, I think it was another VK6, just try again. Uh, VK6 Alpha Zulu, I think that was the. Uh, that was from last week, just checking my call book. Oh, it's Alpha Oscar Zulu. Yeah, Alpha Oscar Zulu. That's you, John, is it? Yeah, go on, John. Thank you very much, Lee. All right, we got you there. <laughs> um, Graham, VK3 BDA. How do I say, mate? VK3 EKH. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Queen VK3 EKH, VK3 BDA. Uh, the uh, call sign of the uh, Bendigo section of the ASV. Uh, thanks very much for the broadcast, Quint. All very interesting as usual. And, uh, yeah, very good signal up here into Bendigo this evening. I think I saw about a, a 30 over 9 signal from you and uh, uh, watched, uh, I watched someone on, um, on YouTube as well. And, um, yeah, a bit of a shame about the um, uh, Indian... Uh, uh, Moonlander, uh, that was uh, disappointing because uh, uh, everybody was so excited uh, initially when it uh, made it to the moon, but uh, it sounds like uh, uh, things uh, haven't gone so well, unfortunately, but uh, uh, that's, uh, that's what it's all about, isn't it, with uh, space exploration, and the, uh, that radio astronomy book looks quite interesting, I'll have to um, have a further, further look at that. So, um, yeah, once again, thanks for the net, Clint, and uh, uh, have a great weekend, everybody. Back to uh, Net Control, VK3 EKH, VK3 BDA, Bendigo. Yeah, thanks, Graham. VK3 BDA, VK3 uh, EKH. Returning, excellent stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I've got uh, the page open, so I'm making a, oh, excuse me, I'm making a decision about spending some dollars on it. Uh, I, I kind of promised, I made a promise to, well, I can't, uh, I tried to make a promise to myself, but no more books on radio astronomy, <laughs> I've, got, I've got, my library here on, on uh, the radio astronomy is, is vast, um, but uh, there are some books there that, are, uh, that I've um, spent a lot of dollars on because they're, they're genuine reference type books and, well, it's full of mathematics that's beyond me. And I look at that and I think, why did I spend the money on this? <laughs> so I kind of made the problems no more. But this is uh, not one of those books. Um, this is historic. Uh, so uh, there should be some interesting reading in it. 800 pages, though. My goodness me. Um, thanks, Graham. Good signal from you. Uh, I didn't check, actually, but you sound like you're about 20 over 9, so uh, you're not doing too bad. All right. Um, and you so concur. It's a bit sad that the uh, probe uh, didn't uh, fire up. So you can't rely on solar panels too much, you know. 
<laughs> anyway, uh, across to you there, Jack, VK3 TJS, VK3 CSJ. Jack VK3 TJS and Shepard and VK3 EKH to returning. Very good. You're uh, about 15 to 20 over 9, so uh, not a bad signal from Shepard this uh, evening. And uh, yes, I've got a long weekend too. Um, Monday's an RDO for me, so <laughs> so it's an extra long weekend, um, which um, with this weather the way it's going to be, it uh, should mean um, hopefully we might be able to get outside and yeah, finish off cutting some grass. So I might try and do that uh, tomorrow if I can at some point. Anyway, maybe Sunday. Um, thanks, Jack. Uh, Ian, VK5, Kilo Kilo Tango, VK3, EKH. Go ahead, Ian. Thanks Ian, VK5, KKT, Two Worlds, VK3, EKH, Nary Warren South. <laughs> yeah, no worries Ian, and uh, thanks for your comments, and um, uh, yeah, I really need a, uh, a shot of caffeine before I uh, uh, get up here on the, on the air just to wake, wake up the brain cells. Normally the first half of an hour I'm, I'm kicking along not too bad, but uh, by about 45 minutes in I start to uh, fall apart. <laughs> Anyway, uh, that's another story. But uh, yeah, thanks, Ian. Uh, good to hear you. And uh, thanks for the signal report. I can't believe that signal report. Um, the uh, inverted V must be uh, working just just right. <laughs> um, yeah, very uh, very interesting. Anyway, okay. Um, Frank, VK3JR, VK3EKH. Have a safe, Frank. Frank VK3 JR VK3 EKH not as uh, not as strong as uh, as I have heard you in the past, but we're hearing you quite well. Not a problem at all. Okay, and no no missions tonight. That's fine. And uh, what else? What else? What else? Yes, look, I I tend to agree. Um, there's a there's a significant dollar figure uh, in launching something like this to 
to the moon and you you would have thought that there might have been just a little bit of a little bit of thought in the, uh, the um, in the idea of the power demand required for these ro for the rover and for the the lander to uh, just you know keep on going a little bit longer during the uh, dark periods when the, the sun's not he hitting the solar panels you you just would have thought there might have been some sort of um, you know some sort of power budget would have been worked out for keeping things alive um, but clearly uh, the, with lack of sunlight on the solar panels uh, definitely uh, uh, flattened the batteries so uh, somebody didn't uh, the, the <laughs> you know the power demand budget wasn't worked out very well so it is disappointing um, but look, there's every chance that if, if the sun hits the solar panels for an extended period of time that the it might just charge the batteries enough for some communication to take place um, how often do we hear of the our Oscar uh, satellites in orbit that have supposedly uh, retired uh, come back to life so um, uh, I guess there's every possibility that uh, it might happen but you yeah, never know anyway thanks uh, Frank uh, across to Martin now VK7 JAH VK3 EKH Yeah, thanks, Martin. VK seven J A H VK three E K H returning. Very good. And um, <coughs> you're uh, averaging about fifteen to twenty over nine. A little bit of QSB, uh, but uh, yeah, the 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 band noise is definitely uh, a little quieter tonight, which is uh, good. And uh, I, I'm not too I'm not hundred percent sure what you were saying about YouTube, though. Um, I, I'm not sure if you were saying if the audio. Uh, was a little bit because uh, now see now I'm looking at my vmix level here and it's telling me that my level's too too much, which means that YouTube would probably be distorting a little bit. Um, I don't know why it's actually crept back up again. I can see that it's crept back up. I don't know why it's done that. Uh, okay, one two one two one two one two. Yeah, all right. I've knocked the level down, <laughs> down one two one two one two just uh, knock that level down a little bit on on YouTube so the, the audio level on YouTube might have been a, a bit uh, a bit too too loud it's always something audio is always a tricky thing with this this medium anyway thanks Martin and um, uh, and all very good uh, Steve VK3 SPX <laughs> VK3 EKH
zero gravity, so it would be, I reckon they're going to take a little while to get back to normal. And, um, yeah, it's also, it is a problem with, uh, unfortunately, with the Indian lander, isn't it? But, um, you know, you're talking about the battery uh, and the power budget, but, um, you know, they say on the website that it wasn't designed to stand on the coal. Well, what do you think was going to happen? Um, so I'm a bit uh, mystified about um, the fact that they didn't uh, really take that uh, into account. I guess having enough power means uh, much heavier batteries and uh, much more fuel to get the thing off the ground and uh, what have you. So um, that's unfortunate. But um, but anyway, it wasn't designed to do it apparently necessarily. So perhaps uh, they think that uh, they've uh, kicked enough gold that it's just getting the thing there. So that's great. Okay, thanks, Liz. And uh, missed a few weeks, but uh, hopefully uh, I'll be back next week as usual. VK3EKH, VK3SBX. Good on you, Steve. VK3SBX, VK3EKH. Thank you very much for uh, the report. And uh, Martin, I do acknowledge your apologies there. Um, Martin's uh, reference was also to Discord too, not not uh, YouTube. So, yes, he he also reports that Discord was uh, an issue tonight. Um, yeah, look, I don't have a whole lot to do with Discord. It's uh, it's Richard VK3 VRS, um, who's uh, one of my offsiders here. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if he's around tonight, actually, because he hasn't made any comments uh, over my left. Oh, he is. There we go. <laughs> I was just about to say he hasn't made any comments over my right shoulder, left left shoulder, but he just did. So uh, Richard Richard's a, a local amateur, and uh, he kind of keeps uh, tabs of things. But he's he, Richard's the one who, who's uh, who's kicked off uh, the the Discord uh, thing, or was it uh, Graham, um, Robert? Uh, I can't remember now. If it was Robert uh, Arrowsmith, Robert, or or you there, Richard? I can't recall. It was. Yep. Okay. So it was Rob. Yep. All right. Very pleasant good evening to Rob too, if you're around. <laughs> um, anyway, but uh, Discord's uh, an interesting little uh, program. It's uh, quite, um, uh, it's, it can do quite a few interesting things. That's for sure. Um, okay. Uh, now we've got to, across. To, we're now turning our chair and turning the the, the beam to to the west. <laughs> um, no beam here. Um, Peter, VK6YSF. Good signal from you when you first called in. Let's see if it's still good. <laughs> VK6YSF, VK3EKH. Thanks for that uh, uh, video that you uploaded to YouTube uh, too the other day. That was uh, excellent stuff. Go ahead, uh, Pete. VK6YSF, VK3EKH returning. Yes, look, very, very uh, tricky to hear you this time, uh, Peter. Um, I was catching uh, the odd uh, word from you. Uh, I, I heard your comment about the antenna. I think you said your antenna is still low. Uh, I think you were saying that you still haven't r raised your antenna uh, for 80 metres. I think that's what you were saying. Um, 
but your your signal's just below S9 here at the moment, just below the S9, and my noise floor is uh, is around about the same. So uh, I didn't quite capture everything you were saying. Sorry, Pete. Um, it was just a little bit tricky to uh, to get uh, a good signal out of you on that last over. So, um, uh, but uh, but like I say, the the YouTube uh, that the, that you sent. Um, was uh, of uh, great interest. Uh, I'm, I was quite impressed with the uh, uh, how clear I was uh, coming across uh, uh, to uh, to your location, and of course also the uh, waterfall uh, display on the SDR was also of uh, of potential interest. So um, yeah, I, I always find that sort of thing of uh, of great interest. And of course I, I put the headphones on, and uh, I listened to the quality of the audio too, which uh, wasn't too bad as well. So uh, thank you very much, Lee, for doing that, uh, Peter. Um, but uh, yeah, a little bit hard to copy uh, that last over, so um, signals might have died off a little bit. Now, John, might be a bit harder to copy you too, I'm not sure, but we'll give it a go. Uh, VK6 Alpha Oscar Zulu, VK6 AOZ, uh, you take it, John, VK3 EKH. VK6AOZ, VK3CSJ, uh, EKH, <laughs> returning. Yeah, thanks, John. You're a little bit stronger, just a little bit stronger than Peter. Um, I think your audio quality is uh, is just a little bit easier to uh, to hear through the noise, um, but there's still just a little bit of QSB on your signal, and uh, I didn't quite capture everything that you were saying. Uh, but you your uh, you definitely uh, the signal is definitely on on uh, the s9 on my pro 3 pro 3 meter <laughs> um, so just a little bit the audio is just a little bit peakier uh, than uh, than Peter's and therefore just a little bit easier to copy but um, still I was having a bit of struggle to uh, to hear everything you were saying uh, I think you were saying something about the uh, audio on YouTube uh, I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure uh, but I, I think you were saying that the uh, audio, um, I, I think on, on the YouTube stream, might have been a, a little bit uh, um, uh, distorted, perhaps. So I think that's what you might have been saying. So like I say, I've been monitoring the audio level here, and, and even as I speak right now, I'm, I'm clipping into the red uh, on the vMix program, which uh, tells me that uh, that's, uh, that alone, the audio level is probably a little bit too too much for YouTube. So... Um, uh, I, I think I've got the AGC selected on this microphone tonight, so it should uh, it should be uh, containing it to some degree. Um, where's my microphone sitting here? I just have a quick look. Yeah, no, I've got the automatic gain control set here, so that the level should be uh, con sort of keeping itself right. Um, but maybe it's still a bit too much. I'll, I'm going to have to review this uh, once once I, I finish tonight. I, I can uh, go back the the whole whole program uh, is uh, available to watch later if you wish <laughs> um, I, I, I always seem to get about 20 views uh, on the YouTube side by the end of the week so uh, which is interesting anyway not to worry thanks John uh, for calling in anyway and uh, really good to get the VK6 uh, component into the uh, the logbook here 
Uh, excellent stuff indeed. Um, all right, I'll just uh, have a quick listen to see if there's any other stations wishing to check in. This is VK3 EKH listening. All right, the noise floor is just on S8. The noise floor here is just on S8. And uh, I mean, I don't have any preamps on or anything like that. And there's no attenuation. So, uh, yeah. My, my kingdom for a uh, an RF quiet location, honestly. Anyway, all right, thanks everybody for calling in tonight. Uh, Graham, Jack, Ian, uh, Frank, uh, Martin, Steve, Peter and John. Thanks, guys. To all the people that are listening on the side that I know are, that are out there, thanks very much, Lee, for, uh, for listening to, to tonight's session, the last day, Friday for September. Don't forget uh, Daylight Saving kicks in on Sunday. Uh, to everybody up there on Discord, uh, Kim, uh, cheers to you, uh, Martin and David and Bill, the K3KHT, and uh, Steve there and Martin, yep, that's all there is, and uh, and the various emails up there too. Thanks guys, appreciate it, may your footy team win tomorrow, enjoy the football if you're going to watch it. Pardon me, and uh, have a good Saturday. It's going to be a, a hot one. Uh, well, you know, up there about, what is it, 26 degrees, I think they said. So it's going to be very, very, very pleasant. 29, okay, 29 I hear. So not bad. <laughs> Cheers all. This is VK3 Echo Kilo Hotel on behalf of the Astronomical Society of Victoria concluding transmissions for tonight on 80 metres and elsewhere. And we'll be back next Friday, um, the 2nd of October, will it be? No, of course not. Um, the 6th. That's it. 6th of October. Just checking that. And uh, we'll see you all next Friday. Cheers for now. VK3 EKH clear. All right. That's it. No other stations there on, on 80. All right. Well, I'll close down here so thank you for viewing the tv and the youtube stream everybody on the vision side of it i hope that uh, you've uh, found the graphics of uh, of some interest t tonight as well and uh i've actually got my um my two monitors working at the last moment tonight i've decided to get my two monitors working i can probably swing the camera i don't have the usb camera attached but if i swing my my camera around Here it is. So I'm actually monitoring now the other repeater. Um, I haven't been able to do that for a while. Um, just move my light out of the way. There it is. So uh, I've got I've got the mass about that. That should be RTV one and RTV two. Just convention, I suppose. But anyway, I'm not worrying about it. But I'm very pleased to uh, to be able to be monitoring uh, the other repeater at the same time now, which is good. Anyway, I don't think the BATC feed was running tonight. Um, it's it's been offline uh, for the last uh, few days, and I didn't check to see if it was running. It doesn't look like it is, so I'll just reset that, refresh the page, and I don't think it is. So yeah, it's a bit of a pity that the BATC is down because I am making lots of references to how to receive RTV and the BATC feed. So a um, bit of a bit of a shame that that's not working. Anyway, that's another story. Yeah, yeah, I think you might have to. Oh, just turn this camera back around here. There we are. All right. All right, on that I shall finish. I don't have any... Oh, yeah. Um, what I might do... Um, can I do this? How can I do this quickly? It's not, uh, not actually very quick, because there's a lot of... Oh, there's somebody there. Um, desktop, desktop. Images, and if I go to my desktop, um, uh, 
Uh, what was that? Oh, <laughs> things that you remember. Um, <clears throat> well, let me turn that down. So I'm going to have to turn you up because I can't hear you very well. <sighs> all right. Um, all right. Um, 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 yeah. All right. I'll worry about that later. All right, how do we do that? Okay, the first thing, down the bottom left, where you've got that input, there's a little arrow. You click on that, and then add a new blank color. Okay. Have you done that? Well, you've got... A few things. So blank, blank what? Uh, so instead of clicking on the actual button, there's a little arrow next to it, and it brings up a tiny little menu. Yep. And then you'll see at the very top it says blank. Yeah. Click well, on that. Okay. Well, I did that, but what's it do? Multi, no. Um, oh, I see. Okay, yep, all right. Yep. Click on the little cog on that. Yep. Pick up the little uh, input option. Go to layers, multi view. Yep. 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 Click on that and then open up your camera onto that. I've got a heap of things in there. Um, where's my camera? I think that's the camera there. Oh, there I am. Okay. Oh, I'm so tired. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And you can then adjust. Zoom, zoom, yep. Zoom it down to the size that you want. And then move it to the position that you want on the screen. Yep. All right. And next. Yep. All right. So that's all done. Okay. Um, hit the X and close that. Should have a colour now. You can rename it to picture picture if you want. How do you uh, how do you um oops rename it to yeah. the cock. Oh you go up to general. Yep. Oh yeah. See underneath the name. Oh yeah, colour. Just yeah. yep. So just, just highlight that. Yep. Yep. And, and then call it whatever you want so you remember picture in picture. Yep, okay, cool. <coughs> picture in picture. <coughs> now close it. Hang on. Okay, and close. Yep, alright. What do you mean, though, in regards to layers? Like, how many... So when you wear that... On the same line as the cog... Yeah. Over to the left, you should have some um, numbers there. They're called overlays. Uh, overlays. I'm not seeing. Oh, the the numbers. Um, yeah, there's numbers one, two, three, and four. 
Yeah, if I can. Right, gotcha. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's now picture of picture. Alright, so if I bring up the sun. So if you now open up a yeah, bath and see under the face to black there's numbers under there. Yep. Click on the number. Transparent. Uh, transparent. So where do you make it transparent? Bingo. There you go. Marble ass. That's just absolutely marble ass. <laughs> well, okay. That's there's still a few key functions there, but um, it's look. It's the same with everything. Once you know how to do that, uh, you'll you, with in this case with vMix, you'll just know exactly which which. Um, operations to do to to get to this point so I shall save this and make sure that that picture in picture remains there which I'll do right now so now I can I can just go through all these other things now and I can keep myself in there that's that's cool I've always wanted to be able to do that Right, and the level of transparency can probably be adjusted in this case. Um, chroma key. Obviously, if you had a green screen, you could actually just put a picture of you without all your background. Yeah, that's going to be the, the next thing I'll... Uh, I'll want to look at um, to make this whole Friday night thing a little bit better because I'm sure from a ham radio point of view folks that are watching the repeater or YouTube are also checking out all the stuff I've got in the back here thinking, oh look at that, I wonder what that is but if I have the green screen of course that all disappears um, which uh, is fine by me I'm quite happy to explore the green screen concept again <laughs> Um, which I might do in, in due course. Um, yeah. Hmm. Just exploring what else is there is here. Well, all right. Well, let's give this an idea. Okay, excellent. And I suppose if I do this, that also happens. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for that, uh, Richard. Excellent stuff. Um, glad to have that finally sorted out.
I've got to update my splash screen too. Um, it's uh, the reference to 160. It's not, I'm not doing any 160 meter transmissions. There's, I'm not on RTV2 anymore. Um, I think there's. YouTube, I could probably change the YouTube because that asv.org.au yeah yeah, well that's always been like that, I could probably lift that up a bit um, yeah, so there's a few changes I have to make to that splash screen so it makes it a bit more relevant relative to uh, what's happening at the moment but that's fine, I'll work on that um, we shall work on that. Thanks, Richie. Good on you, mate. Have a good day tomorrow and uh, enjoy the footy if you end up watching that. And um, yep, yeah, we'll uh, we'll catch up with you a little later. So uh, this is VK3 CSJ uh, concluding transmissions for tonight on the repeater. We'll be back next Friday, so um, I'm departing the scene. Cheers, everyone. Take care. Bye for now. Colour bars. Where's my colour bars? There. Oh, look, I'm still there.